On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. Stephen Scherer, to address convocation. Good afternoon. Chancellor Cowan, President Chakma, Dean Barmby, Pro Professor Singh, Professor Hill, distinguished guests, and graduating class. 31 years ago, I sat, like you, amongst my peers, waiting to be handed my degree and to get on with my life. Like you, and probably your parents, and my parents, I wondered where that degree might take me. Some of you will continue in science, others will go elsewhere. Whatever the case, in receiving your degree today, importantly, each of you has demonstrated the fortitude to finish what you have started. This is what makes great scientists and great citizens. Congratulations, we are all so proud of you. I will make two predictions today. The first is that your degree in science should serve you well, because those who can thrive by critical and creative thinking in an increasingly data-driven world will build the future of Canada and the world. The second prediction comes at the end. Three decades ago, in my field of science, genetics, we studied one gene at a time. For my fourth year honors project, I sequenced a single collagen gene from the roundworm C. elegans. Roundworm C. elegans. It took eight months, something now that could be completed in perhaps eight hours. Then in 1989, as a graduate student, I worked in a lab at the Hospital for Sick Children that discovered the gene that, when absent, causes cystic fibrosis. That project took a decade. Now it would take a graduate trainee perhaps 10 weeks. Contributing to another decade of research, mapping chromosomes, the year 2000 saw the first drafts of the human genome sequence emerge. These were mosaic prototypes of billions of genetic letters patched together from a mix of anonymous donors, which cost some $3 billion to complete. Then in 2007 and 2008, Two astounding studies released the first complete genome sequences from identified individuals, namely genome pioneer Craig Venter and DNA icon James Watson. This is when everything changed. Biology quickly moved from studying one gene at a time to studying all of the genes at once. And along with the more complete genomic information came opportunity for rapid hypothesis-free observation and comparison across medicine and all of biology. The Venter Genome Project, worked on by my group, cost some $70 million at the time. By the end of this year, 2018, my team will complete the first phase of a study on autism generating the genome sequences of 10,000 individuals for a total of $10 million, or only $1,000 for each one. The price may hit $100 before you get your first job. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> for your parents, maybe before they move back in and out of the house again. The point is that cost is plummeting very quickly. The genome, of course, is the DNA instruction book contained in each of your body's trillions of cells. It provides a blueprint for all aspects of your development from conception to adulthood. We inherit one half of our DNA from our parents, as they did from their parents, and so on, right back to the beginning. For me, it is awe-inspiring that the human genome has evolved to one that can direct the formation of an organism with minds capable of decoding our own instruction manual. This is truly astounding, and it all happened in our lifetime. I would like to spend the next few minutes sharing with you three examples of just how revolutionary this genome information can be in understanding ourselves. First, in addition to the human genome, researchers worldwide have now cataloged the genomes of thousands of other species from Darwin's Tree of Life. If you were to look at the genome sequence, sequence uh, sorry, our genome sequence compared to other sequences of other species, our genetic blueprint would appear not so grand in design. For example, our genome has near to the same number of genes, 25,000, as that roundworm that I studied in my fourth year project. Using miraculous technologies that allow sequencing of minuscule amounts of DNA from extinct animals, we even now know that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals mated with each other when they cohabitated caves in Europe and Asia some 50,000 years ago. The current evidence suggests sapiens humans emerged over others because of a handful of mutations that allowed us to communicate and socialize better, at least until cultural evolution took 
over leapfrogging us ahead. The second example uh, is this. Each of our own DNA is identical uh, to everyone else's by 99% identity in some way to every other human on the planet, regardless of race, religion, or color. I suppose a discriminant could focus on the 1% difference. However, that would be bad science because there is often more genetic variation found within groups than between them. Believe it or not, along with some DNA shuffling during gametogenesis, each of you in the audience only differ from your parents by about 100 different genetic changes. This is quite incredible when you think about it. Where we become unique from each other um, comes not so much from genetics, but instead from our experience exposures and our experiences, and the decisions we make in response to these. The evolutionary lesson here is that while your genes may have helped you get to the auditorium floor today, where and how far you go now is really up to you. The third example, beyond anthropology, there are pragmatic reasons for all of us to become informed about our individual genomes. We now know that one in 20 Caucasians carry a mutation involved in cystic fibrosis but that you have to inherit a faulty copy from each parent to be affected. One in 66 newborns will develop autism. And for 20% of these individuals, we already have DNA tests. The list goes on. There are some 6,000 genetic diseases that afflict our species. And believe me, nobody is entirely genetically healthy. Thankfully, there are groundbreaking medical discoveries based on genomic data coming every day. For example, for individuals with cystic fibrosis, there are new drugs that can ameliorate the effect of specific mutations effectively treating a subset of individuals with this form of the disease. In the case of autism, there are new medicines that modulate brain chemistry, holding great promise for some individuals with clinical trials starting this year. The new genomic tests are also important because <clears throat> for some forms of cardiac disease, cancer, and mental health, knowing your genome can save your life. In other instances, your genetic sequence might reveal a drug or a dose you should take or avoid, or a lifestyle change that leads to better health. Relevant to all three of my examples, we need to treat DNA information carefully because it can inform not only on your present, but also your past and your future. And understanding complex genomic information becomes even more complicated when it is used in carrier and family screening, fetal testing, or in forensics. I teach my own students that the applications of genetic science are now only limited by our creativity. In fact, moving beyond decoding genomes, scientists have now developed what might be considered even more divine technologies that allow genomes to be synthesized and mutations to be corrected almost effortlessly. Where we take our species, and for that matter, any species, including the ones we might desire will become a discussion for the generation of scientists and citizens of the graduating class of 2018 sitting on the floor today. It's really up to you to take this information and where you want to take it. No pressure. I'm sure the lectures of Professor Singh and Hegela and Hill in biology here will have you up to the task. I will now end with a second prediction and some advice. I believe the most sci successful scientists of my generation were the ones who built the machines and the methods to generate massive novel data sets never before available. It's relatively easy to make a discovery if you are seeing something for the first time. Today I spoke about moving from studying genes to genomes in biology. There are equivalent examples in chemistry, physics, mathematics, statistics, and the environmental and earth sciences. My prediction, at least for the life sciences, is that the next major breakthroughs will come by scrutinizing data originating from the intersection of the relatively young disciplines of genomics and artificial intelligence, or AI. I fully believe that with the massive population scale DNA sequence data sets coming, AI-based approaches will, will reveal nature's rules. Those scientists holding this knowledge will drive the next generation of scientific ideas and economies forward. And my closing advice to this graduating class draws from the information passed on to me at my own convocation three decades ago. That is, guided by the lessons of your parents and your professors, independently follow your intuition to the right place for you. Do not let your genome hold you back. It is a framework to build upon. And undertake all of your endeavors with Western Mustang fortitude. 
If you do these things, you will end up just fine. Congratulations.